You're listening to the Knowledge Archives podcast. Welcome to the Knowledge Archives podcast. We're a group of students on a mission to learn from as many different disciplines of knowledge as possible. I'm your host, Madhav Malhotra, and today I'm lucky to be joined by Dr. Zach Blount, an evolutionary biologist and research assistant professor at Michigan State University in the U.S. His work studies the evolution of bacteria to answer questions about advanced concepts like evolutionary contingency. So thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time and I'm very excited to dive into this very specialized aspect of biology that I certainly had not heard about before. And just before we dive into all the details, I'd love to hear a little bit more about yourself and what you're up to right now, as well as your story and how you got involved in this area of research. (laughs) <laughs> well, my name is Zach Blount. I'm a research assistant professor at Michigan State University. I work with Richard Linsky doing experimental evolution with E. coli. As far as my story goes, I grew up in rural North Georgia in the mountains and got interested in biology and all sorts of science very early on and discovered microbiology in college at Georgia Tech. I had an introductory micro course that was just, oh, it was amazing. It was eye-opening. There was this entire world I had not known of before. And when I got done there, I think my thinking was I wanted to study astrobiology. So this notion of life on other worlds, not directly because we don't have any instances right now, but you can kind of think of it as biology broadly construed? What is life like as a general phenomenon in the universe? And I knew that Michigan State and a few other places had astrobiology programs where people were studying facets of this topic. But I didn't feel that I had the research experience just yet. So I went to the University of Cincinnati and got a master's studying a hypothermophilic archaean called sulfalobus, which grows in boiling sulfuric acid pools around volcanoes. And then after I was done there, came to Michigan State where I rotated into the astrobiology lab and it just didn't fit me. But I had another rotation, you know, the first year that we are doctoral students in microbiology at MSU, we rotate through different labs to get experience and see where we fit. So my last rotation was in the Linsky lab where we do experimental evolution here with fast growing microorganisms that allow us to study evolution in real time. And I just fell in love with it. And I fell into this project that is a takeoff on the lab's premier experiment, which is this long-term evolution experiment with E. coli that Dr. Linsky started back in 1988 when he found 12 initially identical populations of E. coli and just let them evolve in the lab. So every day we transfer them to fresh medium. We've been doing it for how long now? 32 years. (laughs) And almost 75 thousand generations of the bacteria. So we've been able to study them, these initially identical populations as they have evolved under identical conditions, which ends up being perfect for studying evolutionary contingency, as we'll talk about today. But one of these populations figured out how to evolve to grow on a resource E. coli normally can. This is a substance called citrate, which is present in our medium to help the bacteria take up iron. And none of the other populations have ever evolved to be able to do that. So when I rotated in, I started working on this project related to figuring out how it was that this population did this. And I stuck with it and got my PhD doing research into the origins of this new trait. And my work since has involved looking at questions like, is this new citrate using E. coli becoming a new species? and looking at other facets of historical contingency using it as a model, which we can talk about a bit later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always been fascinating to me with these multi-generational studies for both the bacteria and both for the scientists as well. So (laughs) I really appreciated that background. And I think that one thing that might be valuable just at the beginning is Personally, I knew that I'd never heard of this idea of evolutionary contingency to begin with. So could you provide a bit of a background as to what that really means and how this idea got started? 
So to get to this, I should probably explain first about the idea of contingency. So contingency is a property of historical processes. And of course, you know, the emblematic example would be human history. You know, you look back at all of these instances through history where the course of events was determined by really absurd accidents and uh, strange coincidences and stuff. Like World War I being sparked by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which involved uh, his driver taking a wrong turn and the car stalling right in front of someone who had been looking to kill him. So this gives the notion that in history, events work out because of how these little chance details work together. And if you change any of them, you end up changing history. So this is the source of all these what if games we like to play. You know, what if Hitler had died in World War I? What if the Challenger had not exploded in 1986 and so on? Well, it's sort of the same thing with evolution. Because evolution is unlike a lot of other natural phenomenon in that it is, in fact, historical. You have what happens in evolution determining what will happen next in evolution, playing out over these very long time scales in which the environment is changing, in which all of these little chance factors are coming into play. Like, you know, if you look at the core processes of evolution, there's mutation, uh, these variants that come into being randomly, they can be lost randomly because of genetic drift. And then there's natural selection, which is deterministic and causes adaptation and provides some directionality. So evolution is very much like human history in this interplay between necessity and chance. And a great paleontologist and evolutionary biologist named Stephen Jay Gould, who is very much this iconoclastic figure and was very interested in history, started in the 1980s pushing this idea that, like human history, evolution too is contingent. So he illustrated this with uh, a thought experiment he called Replaying Life's Hate, where he posited that we're one to go back in time and restart evolution from any time in the distant past, say before the uh, asteroid impact 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs, and then you let evolution replay, it would lead to a living world very different from ours because history wouldn't play out the same. Or if you went back and intentionally caused a change, evolution would play out differently. So that's this notion of uh, evolutionary contingency, that because of this interplay between chance and necessity and evolution, that random things pop up in the course of evolutionary history that determine evolutionary outcomes. And under Gould's view, evolutionary outcomes are so sensitive that any change that takes place in the course of the history will lead to something different. So that was Gould's view. He died in 2002. And because he spent the latter part of his career really emphasizing the importance of contingency, it got a lot of attention and people started trying to figure out how we could actually test these ideas that he came up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really, really fascinating to hear about that example in particular, the example of Archduke Ferdinand, those fascinating moments in history. It's very incredible to think about how they might be connected to biology. But then, mm -hmm. exactly as you said at the end there, it really started off as this idea of one father figure. How did this idea then go on to be tested in different ways so that it could evolve from something like a philosophical thought experiment to now this idea that can be experimentally verified with biology? Well, I think it's arguable whether or not it can be called a philosophical thought experiment. Gould insisted that contingency really was a reality, and his thought experiment was to illustrate what he meant. And of course, he said when he posed this thought experiment in a book that was a bestseller called Wonderful Life, this experiment can never actually be conducted. So um, he, he kind of got to have his cake and eat it too, and that he was able to assert that contingency was real and use this thought experiment to theoretically demonstrate it, but then not have to let anyone do the work. 
But because Google was so vociferous about this idea, people started, you know, doing things like looking into evolution and seeing, for instance, if novel features like flight and so on are products of particular histories, we wouldn't expect them to rise more than once. But in fact, if you look at these different novel traits like flight, they've arisen multiple times. And so this argument was put forth that actually it's convergence that's more likely that regardless of history, evolution is going to end up in the same place. But past that, people started realizing that there was this up and coming new way of, of examining evolution, this being experimental evolution with microbes and other organisms like what we do in here. And we realized, well, I say we, but my predecessors realized that with experimental evolution, we can make Gould's thought experiment real because with the long-term experiment, we can found genetically identical replicate populations that we then evolve under the same conditions and see if they all evolve the same way and converge on the same endpoint, or if they go in radically different directions. Gould, of course, would assert that because of historical differences that pop up, they would evolve differently. And so there have been various takeoffs over time in experimental evolution of doing these replay experiments, of instantiating Gould's notion of replay in the table of life. Now, there have also been those like Jonathan Lassos who have studied examples in the real world of natural experiments where it seems like evolution has replayed the tape. So specifically, he looked at and still studies these anolis lizard populations on islands in the Caribbean. And what he has found is that lizards will or have come to different islands and then diversified into the same kinds of ecomorphs that occupy specific niches on each island. So these are the ways in which we've studied it, you know, instantiated replay experiments in the lab and then also searching for natural experiments uh, out in the real world, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And to talk about the difference between the two. So intuitively, I understand that when it comes to studying this process in real life, obviously it takes a lot longer for certain species like the lizards you mentioned versus okay growing bacteria in a lab, but are there any other major differences that make one approach maybe more feasible or beneficial than another? I, I wouldn't say more beneficial. I think that both contribute to figuring out the role of history and evolution. They, they both are necessary. There are some additional differences and uh, I would say benefits to doing laboratory evolution experiments like ours. And this is not simply that E. coli, for instance, grows faster and so we can study more generations in the lab than Dr. Lassos can of his lizards in the Caribbean. We can also do things like manipulate the environment very carefully or if we identify mutations over time, that seem to contribute to one population evolving differently than others, we can put that mutation into an engineered construct E. coli and see if it evolves the way we would predict based on this mutation. But we can also, and we have done this with the long-term experiments, freeze different time points. So with the long-term experiment, we have frozen samples of each population every 500 generations since the beginning. And bacteria aren't like humans or zebras, where if you freeze one of us, we die. E. coli instead, it kind of goes into suspended animation. So we have this complete frozen fossil record of viable bacteria in our freezers, and we can revive those at any time. So we can study particular time points that we think might be interesting, or in the case of work that I did, go back into the fossil record and restart the evolution of this population at different time points and see if there was a point after which it became more likely that the bacteria in this population would re-evolve the use of the citrate. And what I found was that, in fact, there was something that happened over the course of the history of this population that it made it more likely to find this trait. So really, with the with the laboratory experiments, 
we have greater tractability and we have some tricks that we can do that just can't be done in the real world, which balances the loss of complexity that we encounter in the lab. The, the lab is simplified and it just doesn't have all the complexity that the natural world has, but it comes with some benefits. Yeah, this is where I am very, very fascinated by it almost seems like a game of life like you have checkpoints you have these different populations you have these different upgrades but <laughs> that's analogy aside i think this is a very key idea though that we were able to find these methods to study this very specific idea in environments with more control and mm -hmm. i was curious from your particular study what insights have we gained about the changes in the environments of the bacteria or some other factor that triggered drastic changes in the evolution of one population versus another? Well, that's the fascinating thing is that, as I said, these populations started out identical and we had kept their environment absolutely identical between the 12 going back to the beginning. We've seen differences arise in the different populations with this one that I study, the citrate users, obviously being the most different. And it doesn't have to do with any differences between their environments. It just is a matter of because mutations random, because genetic drift is random, different populations accumulate different mutations over time, which then alter how they can evolve going forward. And in the case of this one population, it happened to evolve very early on a type of fast growth on glucose that caused those fast growers to spill a substance called acetate or vinegar out in the medium. And that opened a new niche, that acetate was a resource that the bacteria could use and mutants arose that could grow better on the acetate and then there were mutations that accumulated that improved the ability to grow an acetate further and then more. And this process of adapting to growing on this resource the bacteria were making themselves ended up coincidentally also making their metabolism better at growing on citrate before they ever got access to it. So that's the really fascinating thing is you don't have to induce any changes for evolution to strike out in a different direction, there is enough contingency that can arise simply from the chance and randomness within the core evolutionary process. And that indicates that though it's difficult to quantify, in the real world where there's so much more complexity, contingency is almost certainly playing a role in how evolution goes if it also plays a role under this really restricted set of circumstances where we've completely eliminated environmental variation. Yeah, and what I'm curious about is that I'm sure it must be difficult and meticulous in trying to make sure that all of these factors are constrained so that you can make sure that you're, at the end of the day, only looking at the influences of this random effect. So given all of these factors that we're trying to control and these, these procedures that we put in place to make sure that happens, what are some of the key assumptions we're making in how these models function and how well can we rely on these setups to explain what is going on in the real world? Well, before I get to the question, I'll, I'll, I'll say that you, you're giving us too much credit. It, it's not especially complicated in the lab to keep everything on an even keel. So as far as keeping the, the environment the same across all 12, we grow them in the same growth medium. And usually each of the 12 is from the exact same bottle of medium. So they're getting the exact same food that we're giving all of them. And we keep them in an incubator that maintains its temperature at 37 degrees all the time. So that's all, that's fairly easy. Now, as far as the assumptions that we make, now we, we are clear that this is a model system and it's a simplified model system. It allows us to get at, at what evolution is like under 
the most simplified of conditions where only the core processes of evolution are operating. Like I said, mutation, genetic drift, and natural selection, that's it. And what that means is what we see happening in these populations, if we see that something's important like contingency, that means if it's there under these restricted circumstances, it's almost certainly going to play a role in the natural world. Now, it's hard to say exactly what role because nature is so much more complicated, but we kind of get a sense of, of what the boundaries are from what we study in here. And that's good because those core processes of evolution are going to be true anywhere in the universe where you have evolving organisms, be it on Earth or Mars or I don't know, some planet around choose your stellar system. But we, we do know that we aren't going to capture all of the complexity of what's going on. We're very clear-eyed about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the theoretical aspects of this is definitely incredibly fascinating. But finally, to get to the last area of questions I had for you, I was wondering about the practical applications of this theory in different aspects of biology or even other disciplines? Well, as far as practical applications go, I I would say that I, I don't know that you can necessarily draw from the study of contingency to direct application in the real world. I think finding evolutionary contingency is playing a role. It provides a caution to us when we're, we're trying to figure out how to do things like control pathogens or epidemics. And this is that because of the role of chance in history, when we hit upon a strategy that is that seems to be effective for controlling pathogens, we have to keep in mind that there may be those that because of chance differences over the course of their histories, they're evolving differently than others. So the strategies won't necessarily work uh, against all of the organisms that we're targeting because of these chance differences that pop up that lead them on different evolutionary trajectories. Now, that said, I think that in some ways, as far as broader society, the value of coming to understand contingency is in some ways deeper. And this is that to the extent that evolution is highly contingent, it reminds us, as Gould did in that book, Wonderful Life, that we ourselves are contingent outcomes of a very particular evolutionary history where the history of life went a particular way, but it didn't have to. That asteroid that struck and wiped out the dinosaurs and made it so that our ancestors among the mammals could occupy niches that ended up leading to us, it didn't have to happen. Our existence is in some sense fragile. And so we can think about what does that mean as far as who we are as human beings? How does that affect our notions of how we go about our lives? So there are some philosophical aspects to it. I think that it also has ramifications for understanding what sort of a process evolution is. Is it a process that can be entirely captured by equations and mathematical models? Or is it one in which eventually those models break down and we have to understand how evolution has gone the way we understand history, and that we look backward and we can figure out how one thing led to another that led us to where we are now, rather than predicting it from some initial point. So I, I, I think that's what it comes down to, is, is a cautionary note on, on how well we can predict how uh, natural populations will evolve while at the same time affecting how we view ourselves. And that, that's actually one of the things that fascinates me about studying evolutionary contingency in that this field is not simply scientific and biological, it's also philosophical and also historical. So there are philosophers and historians working with biologists to try to figure out where to take this field next. One of your questions had to do with open research questions. And I kind of chuckled when I got to that because this field is so young, it's hard to tell exactly what we do and do not know. (laughs) So 
there are a huge number of questions left to to get at, and you know it's it's wonderful getting to work with philosophers and historians to figure out what those questions could be. Yeah, I think that is an incredible note to wrap up on, and it really just highlights this field is important in not just as you mentioned first order knowledge of、mm-hmm. our way of understanding the world, but second order knowledge of Understanding our understanding of the world, and、mm-hmm. it's it, it's incredible that this is a young area because that's definitely a very open area of questions to be asking, and there's a lot of possibility there. So I'm going to be very excited to <laughs> keep looking at what comes out on this topic, and I really really appreciate it you taking the time to walk us through the basics of it today. Oh, absolutely! This was a lot of fun. <laughs>